Speaker, free and fair trade is fundamental to the prosperity of the United Kingdom. That is something that all sides of the House can agree on. As globalisation and new technology have changed the face of the world economy, the old barriers of distance and time have been eroded. In an age where data, knowledge and expertise are traded as readily as cars and steel, even the simplest transactions are no longer confined to one country or even one continent. The United Kingdom is one of the world's leading trading nations. The total value of our trade with the rest of the world is equivalent to over half our gross domestic product. We are the most popular destination for foreign direct investment in Europe, and last year FDI created or safeguarded an estimated 108,000 new jobs. British companies operate across the globe with an international reputation for quality and expertise that few nations can match. This has enabled us to boost the total value of our exports by around 14 per cent in the last year to some £617 billion. Our current success is, of course, built upon a long and proud trading tradition. From our unilateral adoption of free trade in the 1840s to our instrumental role in founding the World Trade Organization, the United Kingdom has been at the heart of international trading innovations. Often, we have led the way, using our economic and diplomatic influence to guide the world towards a free trading future, confident in the benefits that the rules-based global trading system can bestow. Yet, for more than four decades, the United Kingdom has been unable to fulfil that leadership role. But soon this country will once again be able to pursue an independent trade policy, whether unilaterally or within bodies such as the WTO. We will be able to unlock some of the key areas of global growth, able to offer preferential market access to developing nations of our choosing, able to develop closer economic links with our Commonwealth partners, and able to influence, as we once did, the future of international trade. I give way to the Honourable Lady. Giving way. One of the real problems with the EU and trade agreements was the lack of transparency and openness. Um, does the Secretary of State believe that we will be able to be much more open and transparent when we are being involved in getting trading deals going with this country and other parts of the world? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I do, but as the Honourable Lady knows, this bill is not concerned with new trading agreements. But when the government does come forward with the mechanics for that, I, I believe that it would be in the interests of all to have as open and wide a consultation uh, in terms of future agreements uh, than, is, than is possible, that is possible and perhaps is even more open than has been tradition in other countries. I give it to my honourable friend. I am extremely grateful because much speculation has been made over several weeks about the possibility of the United Kingdom staying in the single market or a customs union. Could he tell us about this exciting world that he's talking about, of doing trade deals with a number of other countries? Would he be able to do that if we stayed in the single market or the customs union? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we know that we would not be able to do that if constrained by the customs union. But I would say to my honourable friend this. We need to look to see where growth in global trade is going to come from. According to the IMF, about 90% of global growth in the next 10 to 15 years will come outside the continent of Europe. It therefore makes sense for the United Kingdom to have the freedom to be able to maximise our ability to trade with those countries where their economies are growing fastest. If we want to generate, if we want to generate the uh, income that this country will need for the spending projects that we all seem to value, uh, I'll give way to the honourable gentleman, and then I'll make some progress. Might I ask the Secretary of State's opinion? Uh, this House voted overwhelmingly to begin the process of implementing the, the referendum decision. Since then, we have had uh, two major bills, this being the second, where the order paper looks as though the main aim is to uh, dis uh, interrupt carrying out the government's intention of uh, following through that referendum decision. What image do you think that gives of people outside where now 75% of the electorate want the government to get on with the job of taking us out of the EU? Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was encouraged to hear reports uh, yesterday of the Leader of the Opposition making it very clear that there was no chance 
of uh, continuing with the single market or the customs union. It is therefore with some disappointment that I see the reasoned amendment today, which does seem to go entirely a different direction. I am not sure what the reasoned amendment was, was drafted for, but it does not seem to be this particular bill, since the reasoned amendment <laughs> concentrates on future free trade agreements which are not actually covered by this bill at all. I'll give away later. Madam Deputy Speaker, this Government believes that we have an unprecedented opportunity, unprecedented opportunity to regain our former influence in trade policy. The United Kingdom will be able to put in place a trade policy that acts in our own interest and that of our friends and allies. But trade is not only about self-interested commercial gain. It is also about nurturing developing economies, eliminating poverty and building partnerships for the future. Closer to home, trade ensures that British consumers can access quality goods at a reasonable price and foreign investment creates jobs and protects livelihoods the length and breadth of the country. Fundamentally, we will have the power to choose our own economic destiny and chart our own course to a brighter and more prosperous future. Yet for all the high political ideals, we also recognise that trade is not carried out by governments but by individual enterprises. To operate, they require certainty and stability. Confidence is a very valuable commodity indeed. The UK has been economically successful partly because our stability, our labour market flexibility and skills and our regulatory environment all inspire confidence in investors and international firms. Yeah, yeah. It is why we attracted the highest number of new foreign direct investment projects in our history last year. I give with the honourable gentleman. You mentioned uh, increasing trade with the developing world. Would you agree with me that the European Union has been the greatest single mechanism for exporting poverty to the third world with its high uh, tariffs on foodstuffs? And when we leave the European Union, we will be able to give our own consumers the benefit of cheaper citrus fruits as well as helping poorer farmers in Africa and elsewhere. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, where I would particularly agree with the Honourable Gentleman is where the European Union applies high tariffs to value-added uh, exports from developing countries. In other words, where they are able to export basic commodities at zero tariffs into the European Union, but if they try to add value, then they will face considerable penalties. One of the areas that I would like the United Kingdom to explore as we leave the European Union is our ability to help those countries be able to export with added value, in other words, to be able to trade their way out of poverty yeah, rather than yeah, depending on aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe that is a policy that would carry very widespread support across the United Kingdom. Um, uh, uh, yes, I give away. Secretary for Governor Way, as you say, this, this trade bill is actually about existing trade, and the trade bill in its current format needs a legislative uh, consent motion from the Scottish uh, Government. The Scottish Government says the bill is not fit for purpose in its current format. You will probably also be aware that yesterday the Holyrood Constitution Committee, including three yep. Tory MSPs, uh -huh. voted to withhold an LCM yep. and EU withdrawal bill. So what is the Secretary and the other Government members going to do to get this bill, an EU withdrawal bill, fit for purpose that will get an LCM at Holyrood. Yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, we believe this bill is fit for purpose as it merely continues what we have at the present time. What I hope is that with our large presence of the SNP on the benches, we'll be able to convince them uh, that our case is correct and just. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I, will, I will later. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, before we can begin to forge new trading relationships, we must act to prevent disruption to our existing trade environment. As the Prime Minister has said, our ambition is to forge a deep and special new partnership with our European friends and allies. We will retain the bonds of friendship, security and trade that have united Britain and Europe for so long. If we want to achieve this, before we leave the European Union, we must put in place the essential legal powers and structures that will enable the UK to operate an independent trade policy. This is what our trade legislation seeks to achieve. In this, as in all our legislation, the Department for International Trade will be guided by what delivers the greatest economic advantage to the UK and ensures the continued confidence of our partners and allies. The, the bill contains six delegated powers, allowing the government to make regulations to support and develop its trade policy. Two of these powers allow the government to amend primary legislation. 
Those powers relate to ensuring the continuity of EU trade agreements into a UK-only context and to the collection of exporter information by HMRC. Both of those powers are subject to significant restrictions on how they can be used. The trade agreement continuity powers are limited in scope. In particular, they can only be used to amend primary legislation where this forms part of retained EU law. We intend to use these powers to make necessary amendments to domestic legislation as part of this transition project. Through taking these powers, we can be sure that we have the ability to efficiently implement all obligations of these existing trade agreements in a new context. The, e the EU's trade agreements, which we are intending to transition and which are within the scope of this bill, we will already have been scrutinised by Parliament's EU committees. Those free trade agreements, which the UK has already ratified, have also been through the normal parliamentary scrutiny process. This bill simply aims to enable us to continue those existing trading arrangements, allowing us to provide certainty and reassure international partners, businesses and investors. Um, first of all, to say how glad I am to hear everything that my right hon. said, not only today, but all the way through his tenure as a Secretary of State. I'm so glad that he's still there and he's still going to go on doing it. Uh, on the question of trade deficits with the with the European Union, uh, would he confirm that uh, in terms of our trade deficit with the EU, of the other 27 member states, we ran a trade deficit which has been accumulating with those 27 for a long time and now it's gone up from 71 billion uh, a year to 82 billion in one year alone. That gives some indication, does it not, of the fact that we are now looking outwards towards the rest of the world and that continuing to pursue a policy of exclusively working in the context of this EU policy run by the tra EU, tra EU Commission does not work for us. Mad Madam Deputy Speaker, I would say two things on that. First, the fact that there is a very large EU surplus with the UK is one of the reasons why I believe it's in the interest of the European Union to want a good and open trading agreement with the United Kingdom. But in relation to my uh, honourable friend's points about the direction of travel, it's certainly true that the proportion of UK exports which have gone to the European Union have diminished from some 54% at the beginning of the millennium to about 42% today. So it's already true that the United Kingdom is exporting into those other growing parts of the global economy. Um, yes, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. Um, I'm going to bring the Secretary of State back to um, uh, legislative consent, if I may, for a moment. Uh, the Secretary of State gives some advice to the SNP members. However, he has more difficulty in Northern Ireland, where we haven't had a functioning <laughs> assembly for a year. Totally frustrating for the people in Northern Ireland. But how does the government uh, think it's going to obtain legislative consent from the Northern Ireland Assembly, or is the government preparing for direct rule in Northern Ireland? It's one thing or another. So, ma Madam Deputy Speaker, um, uh, the Honourable Lady gives me actually a very uh, uh, acute moment to pay tribute to my right honourable friend uh, who stood down from his post yesterday and to pay tribute to his work in trying to achieve uh, a deal in Northern Ireland. We all hope that there will be a functioning government that the United Kingdom uh, government is able to deal with. The, it's in the best interests of all concerned in Northern Ireland that we get a functioning democratic government uh, in instalments. Uh, I give away once more at the moment to my honourable friend. Very right honourable friend. To my right honourable friend. Would he confirm that all those countries that do have trade deals with the EU have either indicated they would like to have a similar agreement with the UK or have certainly not indicated the opposite, that we can look forward to those novating transferring to us? Madam Deputy Speaker, I can indeed confirm that, that there is considerable interest uh, in the continuation of those trading agreements with the United Kingdom for one overwhelming reason. We are the fifth biggest economy in the world and provide a very large market to those countries that want to trade with us. So they have every interest in wanting to continue those particular agreements. Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I gave away a number of times, I'll make some progress. Uh, the new legislation that we have brought forward has four primary aims. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, it aims to prevent disruption to UK businesses and consumers. 
Earlier, I alluded to the importance of the UK's ability to access other markets around the world. Currently, as a member of the European Union, we are part of around 40 free trade agreements across the world, as my right honourable friend has just mentioned. Maintaining that market access for UK companies is a priority. That is why, as we leave the European Union, we seek continuity and have therefore been very public about our aim to enter into our own agreements with our partner countries which maintain the effects of the free trade agreements currently in place with the EU. The Bill will create new powers to make regulations where required to ensure we can fully implement these free trade agreements and our other existing trade agreements as we leave the EU. By ensuring continuity in our existing trading arrangements, we will provide certainty and stability for workers, consumers, businesses and our international trading partners. Secondly, we want to maintain UK businesses' guaranteed rights to access global public procurement markets worth approximately £1.3 trillion per year. The GPA, or Government Procurement Agreement, is a plurilateral agreement within the framework of the WTO which aims to create an open market for government procurement among participating nations. These include many of the world's major economies such as the United States, Japan and Canada as well as the EU states. Currently, we participate in the GPO, GPA through our membership of the EU. And it's worth pointing out that the UK creates around £68 billion worth of procurement opportunities within the GPA annually, over 25% of the EU total offering. After we leave the EU, however, the UK will need to join the GPA as an independent member, not only to safeguard continuity of access for UK companies overseas, but also to ensure that we can tap into international expertise and obtain the best deal for the taxpayer here in the UK. The powers in Clause 1 of the Trade Bill will allow us to make regulations implementing our obligations under the GPA as an independent member reflecting our new status within the GPA. Parliament will be able to scrutinise the terms of our membership of the GPA through the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act before we join. I totally support what he is getting at in terms of Clause 1 and the need for us to uh, re-engage with the GPA. But doesn't this clause also show how vital it is that we do uh, leave the EU with agreements in place rather than just falling off the cliff approach? Because actually we are not a member of the GPA through our membership of the EU. We, have to, we will have to rejoin in our own right in the same way as we will have to re-engage with our schedules, which again we have through the EU rather than in our own right. Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as a doctor, I never actually thought falling off a cliff was a very sensible thing to do. Um, uh, and it's certainly clear that it is, beneficial. it is beneficial to the United Kingdom to have a number of agreements in place. That is why we're bringing this legislation forward, to provide maximal continuity and security. It is the whole point of the legislation uh, itself. Uh, and my honourable friend is correct that we also have to do the same exercise with our schedules in Geneva. I would just make one slight correction that we are an independent member of the WTO in our own right already. We simply operate our schedules through the European Union. We are not a member of the WTO by virtue of our membership of the European Union in the same way as we are with the GPA. I give way to the honourable lady. Said giving way. Given that this bill covers only existing EU trade agreements, can he guarantee that there will definitely be a second trade bill in due course to cover new trade deals with non-EU countries? And if he can't guarantee that, will he accept that it is even more important that it is in this bill that the openness and transparency that he claims to support is actually reflected? And one way to do that would be to make sure that Parliament does have the right to reject trade agreements, as they have in the European Parliament, mm. as they have in the US Congress, not yeah. just a negative procedure, which isn't a real opportunity to say no. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, as I think I already uh, said, uh, it, when it comes to new free trade agreements, we will bring forward separate vehicles and we will bring forward a separate proposal on consultation. I am very keen that we do not get to the position that we got to, for example, in TTIP, where our whole negotiation had, was undertaken only to find that there was insufficient public support for it. It is much better to seek support for a trade agreement mandate 
by having a wide consultation, as wide as possible across the country, with various ranges of stakeholders, before we enter into those negotiations. I think it is, it is more, more democratic. I also think it is actually more efficient in terms of the process. And I think that because consumers will take a greater interest in trading agreements in the future than perhaps they have taken in the past, it is also a politically prudent thing to do. I give to my uh, the state for giving way. He's absolutely right to say this bill, of course, is to prevent anybody falling off any sort of cliff edge. But one of our most important trading relationships is, of course, Canada, which is currently covered um, through our relationship through CETA. Uh, will he confirm that the Canadian <coughs> government has absolutely committed itself to an FTA uh, with the United Kingdom once we leave? the European Union and have also established joint ministerial uh, council with us because contrary to what we hear from some uh, who seem to be unable to accept the result, there is actually quite a lot of enthusiasm in many of our bigger trading partners such as Canada uh, to ensure that we have a new relationship which goes further than perhaps the arrangement we have through the EU at present. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I can confirm that we have had very positive discussions with the Canadian Government. I can also confirm it is our intention to, to ratify CETA before we leave uh, the European Union, as we have said that we would do. Um, and if we, once we have left the European Union, CETA would form the very good basis for any future agreement that we might, we might want to have with Canada that took advantage of increased trading freedoms that the United Kingdom might have unrestricted by elements such as data localisation restrictions placed upon us at the present time by the EU's negotiating position, um, of course. I'm very grateful to the Secretary of State for giving uh, way. This bill is a consequence of the Government's decision to leave the Customs Union. Can the Secretary of State explain, as we learnt from his colleague, the Secretary of State for Exiting the European Union, why this was, decision was taken without any economic assessment at all having been undertaken of the consequences of leaving the customs union and could he now set out for the house why he thinks the gains will outweigh any potential losses Ooh. speaker i hate to correct the right honourable gentleman this bill is a consequence of the british public's vote to leave the european union and its vote to leave the european union and having left the European Union means that we are leaving our current trading agreements. And if we are to continue stability for our, our businesses, then we have to put the legislative framework in place for them to do so. That is exactly what we're doing. Now, Madam, I'm, I've given away a number of times. I'll, I shall give away again later on. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's also worth my reminding the House um, that we have made a commitment on a number of occasions that decisions about public services, for example the National Health Service, will be made by UK governments, including devolved administrations, and not by our trade partners. As we leave the EU, the UK will continue to ensure that there are rigorous protections for the NHS and other public services, included in all trade agreements to which it is party. Now, the third aim of our bill, Madam Deputy Speaker, together with the Taxation Cross-Border Trade Bill, will be to create a new UK trade remedies framework overseen by an independent body, the Trade Remedies Authority. It is important to remember that free trade does not mean trade without rules. Free trade is not a free for all. Trade remedies are a vital safety net for firms operating in the global marketplace protecting them from injury caused by unfair trading practices, such as dumping or trade-distorting subsidies, as well as from unforeseen surges of imports. After its creation, the TRA will be required to prepare both an annual report on the performance of its functions and an annual statement of accounts. These documents will then be laid before the House of Commons ensuring that Parliament is able to fully scrutinise the TRA's functions and financial activity. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank the, uh, uh, the Secretary State for giving way, and I'm sure when he visited Stoke-on-Trent last month, he would have heard from Wade Ceramics the importance of a proper trade remedy authority. Yeah. Um, but could I push him on the point that's reported in today's Telegraph, that when trade remedies are being considered, they will be weighed up against any potential negative impact they may have on a broader free trade <coughs> deal with those countries. So in the case of ceramics, Chinese tiles, Chinese tableware are things where we need protections. But if that impacts a larger trade deal with China, can the Minister assure me that British industry will be protected before trade deals are put in place? 
Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I, would, I totally agree with the honourable gentleman on the need for the setting up of such trading uh, remedies, uh, in which case I'm, I hope he will be supporting uh, the bill today, because without this bill we will be unable to have such trade remedies no, as we leave no remedies, the European no Union. No but, he's, but it's essential that we have a mechanism to protect the United Kingdom and that we are not allowing unfair uh, dumping or subsidy to cause harm to our UK businesses. That is why we are setting this up. The details will be set out uh, subsequent to the passage of the taxation uh, cross-border bill. Um, but he's quite right that we need to have these in place. But I reiterate that if we don't pass this legislation today, we would not have the ability to create those remedies and protect yep. British business. Yep. And I say to Thank members you. opposite that if they oppose this bill, they will be opposing the very measures that would be able to protect British businesses exactly. and British jobs. Exactly. I'll give way once more to my exactly. friend. Uh, Secretary of State, for giving way. I think the good burgers of South Ham will be uh, very glad that Secretary of State is delivering Brexit, for which they supported her uh, wholeheartedly. On the Trade Remedies Authority, could he confirm that will be wholly independent and give us a, some indication, once this bill does pass through both places, how quickly some of the detail uh, will come together and what forms of consultation will be put in place uh, to see how uh, this Trade Remedy Authority will be set up, given we have so little experience of it um, other than through the EU at the moment? Uh, again, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am grateful to my honourable friend, as he knows the detail on the implementation of the Trade Remedies Authority is will come a secondary legislation subsequent to the passing of the Customs Bill that we debated last night um, in this House. This bill merely creates the framework for the creation of the authority. It will be an arm's length uh, authority. It is very important that because these issues are very often commercially very sensitive and market sensitive, that we are not seen to have overt political intervention in it. And likewise, if we want to be WTO compliant, we want to look as though and to be as though we are as transparent uh, as possible. We will, want to, we will want to consult further, but we will want to set out the details as soon as possible. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, closely related uh, to this is the Bill's fourth aim. We want to enable HMRC to collect and share essential data on the United Kingdom's trade flows. This will enable DIT, as well as bodies such as the Trade Remedies Authority, to perform essential f trade functions such as providing evidence to WTO panel's ruling on trade disputes. It will also provide a vital insight into our export performance during our development of trade policy. I'll give way on the gentleman for giving way. And on the matter of HMRC collecting data, can he give us an idea of how much more resource HMRC yeah, are going to get so they question. can do this job? And are they going to expand the number of offices yeah. rather than reducing the number of offices, yeah. which is what he and his government are currently doing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, my understanding is that HMRC were already given extra resource in advance be before we reached this point. And it actually seems to me, it seems to me strange that we don't collect this data Absolutely. already. If we want to have better informed policy, we need better data sets. And it seems to me merely a sensible uh, option for any government to take to collect this data Absolutely. as widely as possible so that we are operating on the basis of better information. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, before I explain further about the process, it seems a good juncture to correct some of the misunderstandings that seem to have grown up deliberately or otherwise yeah. around this bill itself. As I explained earlier, the bill contains two powers that allow the government to amend primary legislation. The power in Clause 2 to implement trade agreements the UK adopts and the power in Clause 7 to, adopt, to allow HMRC to collect the exporter information that the Honourable Lady has just referred to. Both these powers are limited in scope and restricted in their use. And contrary to the belief of some in this House and beyond, it seems including the shadow Secretary of State for International Trade himself, this bill does not legislate for powers that could be used when implementing new free trade agreements with countries with whom the EU does not have a free trade agreement before exit day. 
Now, an article in The Guardian, uh, which I don't avidly read, I confess, but uh, was brought to my attention, an article written by the Honourable Member for Brent North, incorrectly asserted that the Government would only be obliged to present the text of new trade agreements under the Convention of the Ponsonby Rule. Yet, as I mentioned earlier, scrutiny of new agreements requiring ratification is ensured by the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010.